The folks involved in that working session come from all walks of life, education, business, government, and community organizations. They narrowed in on four main topics, data tracking, quality standards, readiness, and funding. This week on New Mexico in Focus, we found out more about what each of those groups identified as their goals and how they plan to accomplish them. We'll look at each group individually with help from our partners at New Mexico First. Here's Executive Director Heather Ballas with a sample of the discussion over school readiness. What I want to do is start out quickly with just an understanding of what is school readiness. Our group had a very robust discussion about school readiness and we realized that there are many things that kindergarten Garden teachers notice when a young child comes into their classroom about whether or not the child has had some strong supports prior to entering kindergarten. And so uh, we felt strongly that it will be important that we talk about how are we creating those supports with families, within the community, around quality services, and also are schools ready for children? Because what we all agreed on is babies come into the world learning. Babies are always ready to learn. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for the babies? Um, right. I, our, our group really focused on that children are born learning. And when mm -hmm. we start there, then things fall into the right place. Okay. And then the question is, how can we get supports to families and communities and schools to, as you were saying, to be ready for children who are such competent, creative, amazing learners. And uh, just to see children in that way is, is mm -hmm. so important and then to find ways to give those supports to families so that they can do what um, basically every family wants to do, to give the best to their child and to, or children and to get the, their, their children off to the best start, uh, 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 the best start possible. Secretary Dinas, do, what do you think? Are we ready for the babies? I, I don't believe we are. I believe that when we go to uh, Best Buy and buy a Blu-ray, we get a manual. Um, I just bought a new car. I got a really thick manual. <laughs> <laughs> right. But when parents leave the hospital with a baby, it's like, here's your car seat and good luck. And mm -hmm. I really think that's, that's where we fall short as, mm -hmm. as a society. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to, and, and we are, especially in New Mexico, a mix of cultures. So we need to take into consideration our cultures and we need to start from there. Um, I, I'm a strong advocate for the olden days when the elders, and, and even now I call on the tribes as the, the teachers of those new parents. You know, the parents are responsible for raising those children and providing what those children need to be ready to go on in life. But without the support of the tribe, without the education and the direction and the learning that they need, mm -hmm. those parents are not equipped to provide for that child what that child needs, to give that child the strong roots. If we're using the analogy of a tree, that child needs to grow strong roots so that it can grow into its fullest potential. One of the things that we talked about in several of the sessions was tied to the analogy that the Secretary is making, which is the issue of the importance of cultural brokers mm -hmm. as it relates to early childhood delivery, as well as a um, uh, collection of things that we need in early childhood, such as data. Um, would you like to talk about that one for just a second? Sure. <clears throat> I think that cultural brokers is a, a unique term that uh, is not well understood, and it really has to do with uh, thinking about culture in a broader term, not just in terms of racial or ethnic cultures, but uh, in New Mexico we have a lot of different cultures. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when you think about the culture of poverty, which cuts across many lines, and certainly um, that has to do, the culture of poverty is part of what's uh, caused us to be ranked so um, low compared to other states with regard to early childhood um, education. And so I think that the more we identify people in communities that can help us get the word out, do social marketing, um, help us to access the local communities so that we're aware of what their unique needs and strengths might be that we'll do a better job of interfacing and partnering with those local communities. Okay. If 
I could add to one of the things our work group talked about um, within the last three or four years, our state has been very visionary in establishing the American Indian Act, the Hispanic Education Act, the African American Education Act, and now we have the Early Childhood Act. So we took very seriously that there are colleagues working on this question of lifelong learning, like Badgie said, from, from birth into um, being very productive citizens in our state, that can help us really think about this early foundation in the, the first years of life, when so much of um, our, 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 the brain develops, that we can, we can make sure that as we're launching the Early Childhood Act, that we're interconnecting these efforts being made by um, other parts of our state to really improve and enrich from a cultural um, understanding our educational systems. What do you all see as the strategy for aligning what's happening in early childhood uh, efforts and what can and should be happening at K-12 or at least K-3 um, in terms of connecting those educational systems? That's an extremely important connection that mm -hmm. the successes that um, come in early childhood need to be built on and continued in, into the K through K-12 system. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking to each other and aligning um, uh, programs and standards is, is very important. I also think that the, the definition of school readiness is what our committee really grappled with. That mm -hmm. was um, a big part of our why was it hard? Um, well, uh, it's that it's not just uh, l maybe looking at how school readiness has been defined in the past in terms of do children have skills that they need to be able to succeed in kindergarten, mm -hmm. but it's as we've been talking about, are communities ready, are children ready, are, are adults ready, are communities ready to welcome these wonderful learning um, beings into the world and support them? And um, having, having that definition be, um, have major principles that both can be understood through all early childhood programs and also into K through 12, but yet there be flexibility there for these differences that grow up as we've been talking about in different cultures and different communities and different language groups. I think one of the very important things about New Mexico is that we have indigenous languages that have been around for um, centuries and um, it's such a strength and mm -hmm. so learning how we can support those languages and cultures in in our state uh, in their unique ways but also finding common principles that some common principles that can unite us around all early childhood programs and then tie us and connect us to the K through 12 community as well and I would like to speak to that um, that issue of flexibility mm -hmm because I think that it's important as we collaborate more and more with our K through 12 partners in education, it's important that we all agree not to take such onerous stances mm -hmm. of in our beliefs and on, in our sense of rightness, mm -hmm. that we're willing to be flexible, yes. that we're willing to collaborate, yes. that we're willing to recognize that it may have worked once upon a time, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in the future. Right. So yes. how do we make those adjustments? Yes. Well, when we talk about early childhood um, programs, we tend to think of services. You know, we tend to think of home visitation or child care or um, pre-K. But um, Lois noted that many, many New Mexico students or New Mexico children are cared for at home by stay-at-home parents who are choosing to make that their career for a few years or more. Mm -hmm. What kind of um, involvement do we have for stay-at-home parents when we talk about including them in the early childhood movement? I think mm -hmm. that's one of the mm -hmm. challenges for okay. us is to extend that hand to those parents who are at this time not utilizing the services that are provided by the state. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, we, we need to be thinking in terms of, we are here to help, we're not here to intrude. Mm -hmm. We're here to offer the help, we're here to offer the tools. Mm -hmm. 
that um, that you may want because you know a lot of our parents are wanting are hungry for guidance and and help and they're concerned about you know especially first-time parents you know is this normal mm -hmm. um, at every turn you know the baby cries every four hours is this normal you're lucky it's only every four <laughs> hours <laughs> but if, if I think that's one of the challenges for us is that we need to extend the services that we're currently providing to to make it possible for us to make ourselves available to parents mm -hmm. as a child is born, mm -hmm. to provide that coaching, to provide the, the tools, to provide the understanding that every child is different. Mm -hmm. So simply because you've had to doesn't mean you're going to know how to handle the third. <laughs> So concretely where I'm starting to see examples of what the secretary just said um, is where an elementary school defining itself as wanting to be a community school that really has a philosophy of birth into elementary school. So as a community school that it imagines how resources come together to support families that just in four years we'll be entering those school doors mm -hmm. if they have a pre-k program mm -hmm. I think there is innovation happening at that local community level mm -hmm. around the way a school is redefining it mm -hmm. itself and I think it's probably no coincidence that this year uh, our state passed not only the Early Childhood Act but also the Community School Act mm -hmm. and I think that okay. what that says is that we've known in New Mexico that the job of educating our children is bigger than a school Mm -hmm. Quite honestly, it's bigger than families. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that notion that it does take a whole neighborhood to raise our children. So I guess I imagine if we can be the catalyst to innovation at very local levels around a belief expressed by our state leadership, and I certainly feel that it's expressed by our legislature and by our executive branch as as an important part of what is our state's agenda that New Mexicans are really resilient and will come up with pretty dynamic solutions at a local level. Many children are being taken care of in family child care homes that uh, that goes beyond sometimes it's relative care as well mm -hmm. but it is also um, people who are doing having a business in their home taking care of either six or twelve mm -hmm. children and though that is where a lot of children in New Mexico mm -hmm. are being taken care of and um, that connected with being part of a community um, connected with a community school, connected with other early childhood programs is um, in the area is a really um, a viable and wonderful way to support in getting that quality services to our young children.